Okay, hello chess players. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the Rey Lopez, beginning after e4, e5, knight of 3, knight c6, bishop b5 begins the Rey Lopez. Then we're going to have a6, bishop a4, knight of 6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1. We're going to have b5, bishop back to b3, d6, c3. And we're going to be taking a look at the Chigurin variation, which is going to start after castles, kingside, h3, knight a5 begins the Chigurin variation, which I know is not the Berlin, it's not the Marshall, but this was what we had to face 90% of the time for almost a half a century between about 1950 and 2000. So anyways, if you like content like this and want to see more of it, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and click on your notification icon. So the correct move here is bishop to c2. Uh, we need to keep that bishop pair, and then black is going to play c5, and now white is going to play d4. Now, this is the part two video of this Chigurin variation. The other part discussed all of the ideas behind pushing the pawn and capturing on c5 and what the differences were there. This is going to be a deeper dive into some of the more specific theory surrounding these two ideas. So one of the specific move orders that black can try is he can actually play this move uh, queen to c7. And one of the ideas behind queen c7 is after queen c7 and let's say knight on b to d2, he intends to play this move rook to d8 with the idea of meeting knight f1 with d5. This was a very cute idea that was played by none other than Paul Carey's back in the Candidates Tournament in Zurich in 1953. It was Bolosowski versus Carey's. And Bolosowski didn't respond great. He didn't respond poorly either. He just didn't respond great. Uh, his move in that game was e captures d5, takes on d4, c captures d4, and then after knight takes d5, he played the very incorrect queen e2 and had a disadvantage after bishop to b7. He could have played the move knight g5, and at least according to the engine, white should have had an advantage here. But possibly even better is just right at the outset of all this, the move d captures e5 seems like the correct move. Uh, the point being that after d takes e5, let's say knight takes e4, we would have queen e2, bishop b7, knight e3, and at least according to the engine, this position should be major advantage white. White's doing really good here. So this was the sort of correct reply to this kind of thing. Uh, of course, you know, other captures are possible. D, D captures would have been possible as well. And then bringing this knight back to d2, e takes f3, e takes f6, bishop takes f6, queen f3, bishop e6, knight e4 would have been advantage white as well. Uh, again, according to the engine, this would have been decisive advantage white. So that's how you meet that idea of rook d8, knight f1, followed by d5. I Actually, even the move he played in the game uh, isn't totally unrecommendable. I mean, takes, 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 and then knight g5 uh, would have been, if, if this was allowed, it would have been a decisive attack after g6 and queen f3. Now, knight takes d5 was, of course, not forced. Uh, maybe bishop b7, uh, bishop to b7 was an improvement as well, so... I wouldn't necessarily go with this line, but it is, uh, interestingly, at least in the game, it would have been very playable. So anyways, that's how you meet the rook d8 idea. What other specific ideas can people throw at you? Well, of course, a lot of people do like to capture once on d4, and they can do this on the previous move as well. And then sometimes they capture once, and then they play queen c7. And now the best move that you can probably play here is something like... Let's say they play knight c6 and put pressure on d4. You can, of course, play d5 here, but it's supposed to be equal after knight to b4. That's why if you want to play a move like d5, you should probably preface it with a move like a3. And then d5 is a totally reasonable uh, positional concept here. It's after something like, say, bishop d7, you could just play d5, and then you have like the normal type of advantage you have with this gaining space maneuver with d5, and then just follow all of the principles that I talked about in the previous video where I talked about how to play these positions where you gain space and you play d5. Um, so if you want to play d5, this is fine. And of course, if they play something like e takes d4, you can play knight to b3, and it's the same as the double capture line if they capture both times on, on d4. So if instead of queen c7, they capture twice, like cd4, cd4, and then say ed4, knight d4, it's going to basically be the same ideas and concepts behind this line, uh, which we went over in the previous video uh, with Kamsky versus Morosevich, uh, but which also happened in uh, Duda versus Gachowski, which we did not go over, and that game was played in 2015. That game continued rook e8, knight c3, bishop b7, and then knight f5, and in that game, the difference between that game and the Kamsky game is... Uh, in that game, bishop f8 was played, and then Duda played bishop g5, which was a mistake, 
but should have had a big advantage with queen f3. So queen f3, h6, queen g3 is major advantage white, according to the engine. So that's the path that we should go down. But needless to say, we really should not be uh, that concerned about black choosing to take twice on the d4 square in any form. Uh, so the other way that uh, black can handle this is, let's say, queen to c7. And then we have uh, knight on b to d2. And then we have knight to c6. So this is another very common way for black to handle these positions. We can play d5 here. So the game that we're following right here is we're following Fiddler versus Piquet uh, that was played in Tilburg back in 1998. And I went over this game uh, pretty extensively in my last video, basically pointing out how Fiddler effectively played on both sides of the board, preventing black from fully setting up the Rubenstein idea with f6, knight f7, followed by g6, and knight g7. So the main thing is he brought his knights out of the way, and then he positioned his pawns on the queen side appropriately so he could play on both pawns. And then as it looked like black was going to set up the Rubenstein setup, he struck in the middle of the board instead of striking directly on the king side. These positions should be advantage white. So going back, uh, we have, again, uh, this multitude of options, you know, between d5 and d capture c5. Another way that black can play things here is black can play knight d7. Now, if black plays knight d7, we should probably follow in Fisher's footsteps. Although, again, it's not 100% necessary. You can actually play d5 even here and just have some sort of advantage with the white pieces. This recurring theme of just playing d5 comes up over and over again, just getting the space advantage and then playing the strategic game of chess. And you should have some sort of advantage with this move pawn to d5. But in the Fisher versus Carius game, Fisher continued with d capture c5, pawn capture c5, and then he brought this knight to d2 with the idea of going knight f1, knight e3, knight d5. And in that game, he had a huge advantage once the knight finally got to the d5 square. Um, it continued queen c7, knight f1, uh, knight b6, knight e3, rook d8, queen e2, bishop e6, knight d5, decisive advantage white. And I'm going to show the rest of that game now because it was pretty cool. So it continued with knight takes d5, takes, takes, and then knight captures d5, uh, you know, breaking through in the middle. White has the more compact structure, the better placed pieces. The knight on a5 is not placed very well, and black has more weaknesses in this position, therefore white's better. So we have rook a7, bishop f4, queen b6. Rook ad1, as you can see, white's pieces are beautifully placed, very compact, everything's in there. Uh, I, I, like, I like to call it Karpov's definition of coordinated, all the pieces are touching. Uh, so, so we have all the pieces touching and all the pieces in the middle. Okay, so we have all kinds of threats here, like bishop h7, followed by queen h5, followed by like sack on d5, uh, takes on f7. That's why, you know, Carius decided to block up the light squares with g6. So then we have knight to g4 going after the dark squares. So... He protected the light squares, but now the dark squares are weak, and this is just what happens. So we have knight to c4, and then we have bishop h6, we have bishop back to e6, bishop b3, and then the concept behind this was really cool. He exchanged on d8, and then after the exchange, he takes on c4 with the idea of sacrificing his queen, because you can't play bishop takes c4 because rook e8 is mate. So queen d6 was forced, and then we have queen to a4, which threatens the e8 square again, so queen to e7 is forced, and then knight f6 check, because you can't take that knight, because queen e8 is made again. So we have king h8, knight to d5, taking advantage of the pin, because why not? Queen to d7, we're not going to exchange, we're going to play queen e4, offering you the knight again, by the way. But again, you can't take it because of the main threats on e8. So then we have uh, queen to d6, uh, we have knight back to f4, and then finally Fisher just wins in the mechanical way. He should have won easily with bishop f8 would have been completely winning and a little simpler. Uh, but instead he played bishop g5, which also won, but it was more complicated. But after he exchanges everything off, the rook and pawn endgame is completely winning, uh, and Kares finally decided to throw in the towel after king g3. So the point would be something like king g3, king g8, uh, you know, b4, and then we would have c takes b4, c takes b4, rook d6, a4, uh, rook d3, king h2, rook a3, a5, and... Um, we have rook a4, king g3, and white would have a decisive advantage. So anyways, so going back, uh, we have one more thing that we can look at here uh, in regards to d4, which is what about just playing d5 as your base level strategy? Like, can we meet queen c7 with just d5? And the answer to that question is yes. 
And it's because setting up like the Ruben scheme position with like knight b7 d8 and then to f7 is not so simple. And even if black does manage to set it up with knight b7 d8 and f7 with knight e8, as long as we set up our queen side with like a4 and b3 and are prepared to play on both sides of the board, it's not so easy to set up a full defense for black when he has to worry about the queen side as well as the king side. And white hasn't fully committed to an all-out king side attack yet. And this is what we learned from Rubenstein when Rubenstein came up with that Rubenstein setup when he was playing against Bernstein. Uh, so this d5 was actually played recently. It was played between Karyana against Norditsky back in 2020. Uh, so d5, we have knight c4, a4, bishop d7, b3, knight back to b6. So again, we have this fluid queenside setup prepared to play on both sides of the board. And then Karyana does something really interesting that shows an astute awareness of what's going on strategically in the position and shows an astute awareness of how these positions work and how the Rubenstein uh, uh, maneuver and the Rubenstein structure works. He plays a5. And this is basically a strategically winning maneuver. Uh, he's shutting down the queen side. He plays a5, knight c8, and then c4. And then after b4, white is probably strategically winning because it is nearly impossible for this misplaced knight on c8 to ever get to the f7 square. And also we have this clump of pieces that, th that is just trapped over on the queen side and is not going to be able to help against the king side attack. So Karyana shuts down the queen side and basically says, hey, um, I'm just going to attack your king side, and that's what he goes about doing, and he starts going about doing it in the most natural and kind of well-trodden ways that date all the way back to 1907. So we have knight on b to d2, g6, knight f1, uh, knight h5, just, I guess, nor is he trying to get something creative, uh, g4, knight f4 takes takes, we have queen d2, bishop f6, and um, we just have queen takes f4. Offering up the exchange, because if you lose the exchange, the dark squares are still going to be weak. So queen takes a four is just absolutely correct. And Nordisky said, okay, well, I'd rather have an exchange than not have an exchange if I'm going to be suffering. So he captured, captured, and tried to defend his dark squares with his pawn by playing pawn to f6. So now we have knight to g3, just building up the position. Knight e7, queen h6, also a very good move. Rook f7. And then we have the first real questionable move in the game from Karyana. He played the move king g2. And of course, he went on to eventually win anyway. But the correct move in this position would have been the amazing uh, pawn to e5, which would have finally broken through and just been awesome. Now, according to the engine, best play would have been something like d takes e5, knight to e4, and the engine saw nothing better than just bringing the other rook over to the king side to defend, which of course just allows this fork, allows d6. And then after queen d8, we have takes, takes, and then rook e1, king h8, queen e3, and then everything falls. Uh, you already have two pieces for the rook here, but everything in black's position is hanging. So the computer wanted bishop c6, rook d1, f5, knight d6, rook g7, and then this pawn falls, and then this pawn falls. And uh, basically black's position just falls apart, and that's what the engine wanted to do. Um, but basically those are all of the specifics um, that you're going to run into in this line. Uh, the only other thing that you kind of have to worry about is when people sort of capture once, and then they bring this knight back to c6. When they do that, I actually recommend Tal's approach here. You can play knight to b3. Now, I also mentioned that a3 is a possibility, and you can follow up with, let's say, bishop d7. You can follow up with d5. This is also completely reasonable, and I've already uh, mentioned that. But knight to b3 is the other idea, basically saying, look, we still want to play the take twice idea. So like if you take again on d4, we're going to take twice. So this is actually following Tal versus Kuzman that was played in Leningrad back in 1977. That game continued a5, bishop e3, a4, knight back to d2, and then we had knight b4 in that game. Now there was another game where they tried bishop d7, and uh, that was a more recent game. That was actually Nakamura versus Noroditsky, uh, again Noroditsky, played back in 2018, and Nakamura won with the white pieces. Uh, but bishop d7 is another reasonable try. So that game actually continued rook c1, rook fc8, and then Nakamura didn't play the best move. He played d5. Again, d5 is not the wrong idea. He just, again, should have prefaced it with a3 and then... This is just advantage white. Um, so going back to that uh, Mikhail Tal game, in the Mikhail Tal game, uh, we have a4, knight back to d2, and then we have knight b4, bishop back to b1. 
bishop d7, a3, knight to c6, and then bishop back to d3. So we didn't end up trapping our own rook, and we're putting pressure on the queen side. We have a strong center, preparing to bring the rook to c1. White's doing pretty good. So the game continued, knight a5, rook c1, queen back to b8, queen e2, rook e8, rook c2, bishop d8, d takes c5, d takes c5, bishop c5, knight h4, g3, keeping the knight out of the f4 square, rook a6, knight h2, rook h6, knight to g4, rook to g6, king h2, bishop g5, queen f3, and it's a super exciting, super tactical position, and after queen to d8, rook to d1, it gets even more exciting when black plays knight f4. So Tal is a genius at calculating tactics, and he had no problem diving into the complications when his opponent played knight f4, and he continued with knight capture c5. And then after rook e5, gf4, we had this move knight to c6, which was a question mark move. The game would have been super interesting if black had found bishop captures h3, which is unclear. <laughs> um, if you play uh, even just like f captures g5, queen captures g5, queen h3, then you have rook h6, which would pin the queen to the king and win the queen. And it's really not clear exactly what's going on after a move like bishop takes h3, uh, which is the move that should have been played. But after knight to c6, uh, Tao won the game pretty easily by just retreating his bishop. He played bishop back to e3, uh, which is just basically winning. Uh, the idea was bishop h6, he sacrificed the exchange, and then he took on e5. And uh, the game was essentially over because after queen takes d3, he played knight f1. And the whole idea was that bishop f4 was countered with just taking it, because the queen is not on pre, because you can't play queen f3 because rook d8 is mate. So you're going to have rook d8, bishop e8, and then rook e8 is mate. So after bishop takes f4, Tal's opponent, Kuzman, resigned. And that was uh, Tal versus Kuzman played in Leningrad in 1977. And um, that is pretty much all of the specific theory uh, that I'm going to go over for the Chigurin variation. Uh, after after queen c7, if, if you follow all of the recommendations in this video, uh, you should be pretty well prepared. Uh, you need to know about the concept of advancing your pawn to d5. You can actually just play that as your default. You can advance it even right here is totally fine. And you can play that as your entire concept. But knowing the other positional concepts behind the captures lines and behind the variations where they take once or take twice on d4 are also really important to understand. And this video should give you a, uh, a good uh, grounding in the theory um, as far as those lines go. Anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess. I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.